Okay. <coughs> Are you going to um, be a Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Wiley Drake Show. We're live on the air on Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C.'s television and radio network. In just a moment, you're going to see me punching buttons because we're not on radio yet. For some reason, the previous talk show host <laughs> is still talking, and he's not off yet. So I can't get on till he gets off. So I'm going to go. We are live on television uh, because I didn't have to wait for anybody to leave there. It's our system. But Crusade Radio is up in Northern California, and they do other programs other than the Wiley Drake Show. And so there's a guy on there. We'll call in in just a minute and connect up with the radio. But in the meantime, as they say in Hollywood, and as my kids are movie stars, they say, Dad, the show must go on. So here we go, folks. Welcome to the, the uh, Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C. And this is our West Coast headquarters. This is our West Coast studio. And we are about rebuilding the family. We started in 2000, so we're not the new kids on the block. Back in 2000, we established an organization called the Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C., praying America back to one nation under God. We have a homeless shelter that we prefer to call a sanctuary here at our church. Uh, we take in about 2,000 people a year. And uh, we house them, clothe them. Good morning, God bless you, and welcome to the Wiley Drake Show. Caller, you're on the air. Again, the rules here are, are you don't have to identify yourself, but you're welcome to do so. So go ahead. Are you there, caller? Uh, this is Alan Hall. Alan, we're live on the TV show now. Was that your intent to call in on the show? Okay, well, we have, we have already been praying for Pastor Kent Hovine, but we're doing a show today not only in reference to prayer for him as a political prisoner down in Florida, but we're also dealing with uh, prisoners of the system here in California and across our nation in reference to Child Protective Services and the other services that are named, different names across the country. So if you just hang on and continue to pray for Kent, we'd appreciate it, and we'd welcome you back uh, again. Uh, you're welcome to stay on with us, but we are going to move into uh, talking to some guests we have here in the studio in reference to the family. And by the way, Kent... Well, I just want to, you know, that uh, we're going to try to hold a rally down there on the 25th through the 2nd of March, and uh, we need people to show up to add power and... Uh, and the government works for us, and so we need to hold their employees in check. Amen. That we, That's know, exactly we what we're talking about today. But also, if there's someone in your area that would like to be involved in this, we do this thing from the point of view of boots on the ground and prayer in the air. You're going to be boots on the ground. We'll not be there. I'll not be there. I was at the last one down there, but I could not be down there for this one. But we'll be prayer in the air here. So tell our listening audience if they would like to be boots on the ground, that is, show up there on the 25th, tell them how to get in touch with you or someone where they can find out more about it. Would you please? Okay, my number, cell phone number is 980 429 6021. Ministry number is 704. Seven three two three zero one one, or the uh, my uh, uh, email is patriot at wakeupcall.at. Uh, but we're in such tyranny, we need people to do more in prayer. We need to, uh, Lord uh, said that without prayer and fasting, amen. Uh, Amen. Well, Alan, give us. Well. Amen. Yeah, well, we boots on the ground down there during that time, and we're also looking to do a uh, uh, constitutional uh, class there in the afternoons uh, for those who show up and things of that nature as well. All right.
right, Alan, I got the one phone number, 704-732-3011. What was the other number? Um, well, that was kind of probably the best one right now. Okay, all right, that's okay. All right, we'll, we'll go with that. Call that number, folks, if you want to be boots on the ground. We're prayer in the air. We will open this prayer line when they're there, and you can call in on the prayer line anytime, Alan. Did we have another caller come on with us? Brother Shorty. Brother Shorty, hang on. Uh, we're continuing on with our program here. And today we're talking about, in particular, uh, this prayer in the air and boots on the ground down there in uh, Florida. And uh, Alan was on giving us that information. And uh, right now, though, we're going to move into a little bit different topic, even though it's very intricately woven together. And that is, as many of you know, we not only fight for people like Kent Hovine, that's a political prisoner, but we fight for families that the families become prisoners of the system. The children are taken away, and the families literally become prisoners of the system, and, and the children as well as the families. And I met a gentleman. One of the things that happens when we talk about this on the air, when we have these programs, one of the things that has been very frustrating for me as a pastor over the years is, is that I've had story after story after story after story after story of grandparents and parents who are literally weeping because they cannot visit their own grandchildren or because they cannot visit their own children. And they're being terribly abused by the system and we've been fighting that. But one of the biggest problems with that is, is that in spite of the fact that we've fought many battles, we've not won many. We've lost more than we've won. And so needless to say, when I heard about a battle that had been fought, I wanted to hear about it. And won. And won, though. But that was what made it even more attractive is because it was fought and won. I have with me uh, the author of this book, and I want to encourage you to get a copy of the book, and I'll give you an incentive in just a minute. But right now, the title of the book is When the Words, We Have Your Daughter, Are an Answer to Prayer. Amen. That's a very strange statement, in all honesty. I'll be honest with you. When the words, quote, We Have Your Daughter, Are an Answer to Prayer. Listen, I have three daughters, so I'm very women-oriented, Okay. <laughs> My oldest daughter's 50, my youngest daughter's in her 30s, and I am very protective of my daughters. Uh, I used to, uh, when a young man would want to come and talk to me or come by the house and visit one of my daughters, I, I would make it a habit to be cleaning my weapon in the backyard <laughs> when he would show up, you know. So I let him know right away yeah. I was very protective of my daughters, yeah. okay? So I am very protective of our daughters. I believe that's scriptural. Jesus was that way. Jesus went overboard to protect the women in his life. Mm -hmm. and, and he was God himself. But when the words, we have your daughter, are an answer to prayer, my goodness, that's a terrible thing. Now, I met Jules Zudar, and uh, he's going to introduce us to this book and to his story. I also have another person here in the studio with me today, Wendy Green. And Wendy has been in the battle, she will win the battle, but that battle has not been won yet. Not yet. So we have both sides of the story here, so to speak. A man who battled and won, a woman who is still battling, and we will win in the future. So, Wendy, we'll get with you in a minute, but Jules, tell us a little bit about your story. Tell our listening audience how your story came about, what happened. Well, um, I had been married for several years, and uh, one of the things that happened is out of the blue, uh, my ex um, overnight kind of developed some mental health issues. And uh, having read a little bit, um, one of the things that we found out, or one of the things I found out, and I actually worked as a licensed psych tech for 10 years in the state of California, is that um, men with schizophrenia usually have that develop in their early 20s to their late 20s. Women have their schizophrenia develop in their late 20s to their early 30s. And so along with that, uh, I later found out that she had said that she had a miscarriage 
But in any event, uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, she disappeared with my daughter for three and a half years. And so <clears throat> I had tried and asked social services over and over again, please tell me where my daughter is so that I could go back to court so I could get visitation. They always refused. So one day at 7 o'clock in the morning, I get a call, and they said, is this Mr. Zudar? I go, yeah. And the direct quote was, we have your daughter. And I said, who is this? And they said, it's social services. Wow. Do you want your daughter? I said, of course I want my daughter. So after three and a half years, what had happened was is my ex again had been picked up on another 5150 and placed into a facility. And uh, they had placed uh, my daughter, who, whose name is Sandra, I call her Sam, that's her nickname. Uh, they had placed my daughter into the Ronald McDonald House over off by Channel Islands. And so in the long process of me getting her back, um, one of the things I tried to do, because I am a Christian man, is uh, try to put our family back together again after several years, that she was in the hospital. Um, I had certain caveats to that, that she would have to take her medication, that she would have to continue on with her um, treatment, and that I would go with that too. So then I found out that the day we moved in together, she had stopped taking her medication. Mm -hmm. So it was a matter of six months or so, and then she had digressed so far that she again took off with my daughter for another year and a half. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that point, she had accused me of abuse uh, of, to both her and my daughter, uh, and immediately I was forced out of the house. I had to uh, start laying out a lot of money. Uh, I hired an attorney to help me with that, and his answer was, well, you're going to have to plead no contest. You're going to go to uh, classes for a year, and then everything will be fine. I said, you're out of your mind. I'm not yeah. pleading to anything. Right. And then uh, I just happened to have gotten who was known as the hanging judge in the Long Beach court system. And uh, it was, a, it was a, a, ju a lady judge who just uh, really hated uh, abusive men. It turned out later that there was absolutely no proof whatsoever that mm -hmm. I had done anything. Uh, I think the doctor's statement said, and, and that was the other thing, is that you know the laws in this state are uh, manipulated by those who would manipulate them for their yes, end. Yes. And so in that, uh, uh, my ex had gone to the doctor three days after the supposed abuse had happened, and the doctor said, uh, well, she had said, well, he clapped my ears. So the doctor said, well, he could have. Mm. And so because of that, I was taken into jail uh, and uh, put in jail for uh, a few days. I had to post $50,000 mm. bond. Mm. You have murderers who don't have to post that, right. that much bond. And so with that, um, I told my attorney, you're out of your mind. I'm not pleading to that. And uh, so in the process of that, she had asked for a divorce. And again, I never wanted the divorce. I really believed, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a faith-based uh, Christian. The book is faith-based. You know, every chapter Amen. starts out with a uh, scripture. And uh, so <clears throat> in that, she said she wanted a divorce. And I said, that's it. You know, you've accused me of abuse. You've done all this. I've tried to put our family back together again, and I'm done. So uh, three months later, and the only thing that I could think of to help me out of my situation was to ask for... Uh, a psychological va evaluation of all three of us. And had I not done that, uh, the story would have come out completely different. There were so many times God intervened in my life that uh, without that, clearly there would have been a, a different uh, end to it. Ladies and gentlemen, this story is absolutely magnified and amplified all over our nation. All the way to the point that and let me tell you a little bit of my story in reference to being involved. 25 years ago, we started trying to help rebuild families here in our area, near Buena Park, near, or in Buena Park, near Knott's Berry Farm, near Disneyland, near the big family mega area here. And we found out that there were a lot of people that were homeless and poor, and a lot of them uh, it was because of mistakes they had made, drugs and alcohol and all those kind of things. But one of the things that began to be very uh, apparent to us as we went into it is, is that many of them were in dire circumstances because they had gone through this kind of separation, this kind of accusation, and, and they just, like we old hippies used to say, they just tuned out and turned on. And they ended up on the street. Exactly. And who could blame them? Because here they're innocent. Some attorney, even their attorney, is saying, oh, you just need to cop to this. You just need to fess up and move on. And, and that is such a stupid 
response. And I say to every attorney that says that, friend, that's a SOS statement. That's called stuck on stupid. You don't admit anything. Let me just give you a case that happened right here just days ago. We have a Iraqi veteran, post-traumatic stress syndrome, injured leg, injured eyes, and injured ears in our shelter, homeless because of that post-traumatic stress syndrome. I, as her pastor and her mother, recommended the therapy of riding a bicycle because of her leg and because of her post-traumatic stress syndrome. And I said, but don't ride on the street. Those people out there will run you over. Mm -hmm. Ride in the parking lots of the little malls and the little shopping centers. So she was out here one night riding her bike, and the police, Gestapo from Buena Park, stopped her under suspicion. They literally ripped the backpack from off her shoulders, two male officers, not female, but male officers. They said, where's your dope? She said, I don't have any. I've got my medication in my bag. They dumped the bag upside down in the parking lot, uh, left it there, by the way, never put anything back. She had to put it back. And when they couldn't find any dope and couldn't find any way to charge her, they charged her with not having a bicycle license gave her a ticket for no bicycle license. Now, I say all of that to talk about what your attorney recommended to you and what an attorney recommended to her, and I told him he was SOS. Mm -hmm. and, and so anyway, Alan. Uh, we're, we're on the air, brother. Just hang on, listen in, join in where you can. Now, at that point, folks, they issued her a bicycle ticket. And later they decided, now here's that legal thing again, they decided that even the judge might laugh at this bicycle ticket. So they raised it now from an infraction to a criminal misdemeanor. Yeah. Arbitrarily raised it. And so she went to court and the judge said, ah, just go down and get a bike license and, 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 and admit that you did it and they'll probably drop the charges. Well, nothing could be worse than that. Because yep. I said, you can't lie. You didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. First of all, the bicycle wasn't even hers. Right. It was her mother's bike. So she couldn't get a license if she wanted one. Mm -hmm. Plus, even if it was her bike, she could not register it in Buena Park because she doesn't have a mailing address. She's homely. Hmm. And the judge said, well, if you just go buy a license, they'd probably drop it. We said, no, we're going to fight it. Mm -hmm. Well, we fought it, and she said to the judge, I'm not going to lie and say I did something wrong. Well, the judge says, well, then are you going to fight it? And so we fought it. Well, the good part of that story is we did fight it, we did go to court, and when the final hearing came up, they dropped all the charges. <laughs> because she said, no, I'm not going to lie and say I committed something I didn't commit. And if I've heard that once, I've heard it a thousand times, literally, the same kind of scenario that he's talking about where some attorney said, well, yeah, they're just accusing you of something stupid. They'll, they'll lower it. They'll just say, well, it could be assault and, and, and go ahead and fess up. But praise God for men who got a little backbone and women who have a little backbone and can say, no way, I am not fessing up to something I didn't do. Yeah. And so this is a case, ladies and gentlemen, where a man said no. I'm not going to confess to something I'm not guilty of just to make the system work right. That's wrong. We've got a man in, in Florida right now, been in jail eight years, did zero wrong, absolutely nothing wrong. They told him year one all the way up to a few weeks ago, if you'll just fess up, you could get out. Yeah. And he's not going to do it. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about how long was your daughter away from you? Well, <clears throat> in total, it was four and a half years. Mm, and in right. between that, I had her for a little bit, too. And, you know, 2000, you said that you've been on, uh, you've had your show since 2000. It was in 2000 that I got mm. full soul legal custody of my daughter. Amen. And Praise then that I raised her by myself from there. But uh, when uh, going back to, uh, you know, the court system, I, I actually got very upset and started to put together my own information. 
So we go back to court, and he goes, are you ready to plead? I said, I told you I'm not pleading. He goes, well, then you're going to go to jail for a year. I said, I'm going to go to jail for a year. You know what? You're fired. Give me my file. If all you wanted was the money, why didn't you just tell me? Yeah, right. And so I took the file. I walked into court. The judge says, where's your attorney, Mr. Zudar? I said, well, actually, she goes, where's your attorney, Mr. Zudar? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I fired him. And she goes, well, that wasn't very smart, was it? I said, well, we'll see, won't Smartest we? Smartest thing you ever did. <laughs> I said, we'll see, won't we? And so I asked for another three months. And she said, I'll give you three months. But after that, there's no more. Mm. So uh, I was able to, at that time then, uh, with that uh, psychologist that I had asked for, for that uh, evaluation, she began to see some things that she thought were very suspect. And then I started putting together all this paperwork, and I got my ex's parents on my side. I got a bunch of paperwork together showing the several 5150s. And I would just like to say this, too. The court system, even though my ex had been 5150'd on numerous occasions, and there were issues with her stability, decided that it was better for her to be with a woman who was mentally ill than with her father, mm. who, who was not. So yeah. on top of that. And again, we hear that time and time and time again where the parent, quote, that is approved, mm -hmm. or even the child care worker that's approved, uh, are, are... Not the abuser. Yeah. They are the abuser. Yeah. We just had a, heard of an arrest mm -hmm. a couple of days ago. Was that you that told me about that, the arrest of, of a, a, a worker? That, I don't think it was me that told okay, me Okay, so it. there was somebody else, but, but one... Oh, 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 you're talking about Rosie Vincent. Yes. She went out there and... I don't love that woman. Yeah. <laughs> And, and but there was a, a caseworker yes uh, on the uh, uh, child protective service side that was arrested a couple of days ago mm -hmm. because of abuse of children mm -hmm. and trafficking not just abusing a child that's bad child enough in and of itself but child trafficking works for the school a and he works for the school and was arrested for that right a and that's the kind of system we're yeah. in that was Desert Hot Springs, wasn't it? I think so, Desert yeah. Hot Springs, that's right. So you you had, uh, you had you were separated basically for four, almost five years. Almost five daughter. years, yeah. Almost. And, but now you've been back since 2000. Yeah. So now we've got, uh, you know, roughly 15 years that you've yeah. been back together. Folks, that's a success that's story. And I want to say to everyone out there that's fighting your case, I've had, I can't tell you the number of people, men and women, grandmas and grandpas, that have said, I just feel like giving up. I just feel like giving up. Don't give up. I got a phone call like that yesterday. You, you got a call like that yesterday? Yeah, Karen Maple out in uh, Vermont. Yeah. Um, and what was that all about, Wendy? I mean, tell us a little bit. Her case. Well, I, I got uh, on my Facebook Messenger, um, I have all my all my people from the different states on my Facebook Messenger all organized, and I get this mm. pop-up saying, I give up, I mm. can't do this. My, my mom just hung up on me. Um, my sister committed suicide, I should just do the same thing, I'm gonna call me right now. Mm -hmm. I was on the phone with Karen Maple for about an hour and a half, mm -hmm. and um, talking her off a cliff. I mean, I we all go through those days where we have the weaknesses, mm. And you know the enemy's just attacking, 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 and, and you, you fall apart. You're mm -hmm. jello. But then, but then God brings in somebody that that just you know the talks you off the cliff. And, and yeah. I'm just honored that you know Karen reached out to me and I'm able to talk Amen. her off the cliff. But today she's kind of you know. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to share with you, and, and I know this is going to get pretty personal, but I, I want to share with you a personal thing. After working for many years with many couples and many men and many women, um, I was becoming very discouraged. I really was, uh, and I sort of went back into my shell uh, of being a pastor, and after all, I was very busy, and in 207, I, I was the second vice president of the Southern Baptist Convention, hmm. and that's a large, that's the largest Protestant convention, mm -hmm. second only to Catholic, and I say that, say it wasn't just a little religious group, the largest. I was second vice president, and that was good for me because it was taking me away from all of the problems. Right. And it was an escapism for me, and I enjoyed doing it, and I'm glad I did. But I realized that it was becoming an escape mechanism for me. And, and just to show you how God works, uh, even though I was second vice president, I was introduced to another lady in our convention, a Southern Baptist lady. I had the national position of second vice president. 
She was the second vice president of the Georgia Baptist Convention, a state convention. She was also a Georgia state senator. And lo and behold, God put us together. And so I met her, and she began to talk to me about her heart and about how she wanted to help children. And she said, I've heard about you, Wiley, and I heard that you're putting together some help for children uh, to get their kids back and so forth. And I said, well, in all on honesty, Nancy, that was Nancy Schaefer. Mm -hmm. In all honesty, Nancy, I've sort of backed away from it. She said, why? And I said, that's a good question. <laughs> I backed away from it because I just sort of dropped it. She said it out. like that? Right. Why? 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 Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. why? <laughs> Tell me again. And I said, well, because I just got discouraged. Oh. I was seeing these families that were not winning, mm -hmm. that were not able to get their kids back, and I couldn't do anything about it. And I'm an action kind of person. I want to help people. It's overwhelming. That's my job. And so I said, but Nancy, I'll be honest with you, I've just sort of backed away from it. She said, oh, Wiley, don't do that. She said, as a matter of fact, I was going to call you and ask you, I know you have a TV and radio show, I was going to call and ask you if you'd like to help me do an expose. Mm. And I said, okay. I hear you, Lord. <laughs> and and so I said, yes, Nancy, I'll be glad to do that. And she said, Wiley, I want to warn you, though, before we do this, that this expose is going to really be tough. I said, what do you mean? I, I'm a tough guy. I, I can take the fight. She said, I'm going to give you proof that men and women on Capitol Hill, senators and representatives, are trafficking children on the hill and I'm going to prove it and I'll get it to you and we'll prove it and I said well Nancy you get that to me we'll go with it she said it's not going to be fun it's going to be tough hmm. three days later I called her because I said you were going to get a video to me mm -hmm. and when I called the office the young lady answered and said Pastor Drake you haven't heard Bruce and Nancy Schaefer were shot to death three days ago. They were killed. The FBI said it was a murder-suicide baloney. I've investigated it, and it was not a murder-suicide. It was an absolute murder. And I told the secretary after I got over the shock, I said, look, please go to Nancy's office. She said, forget it, Pastor. When she was killed, the day she was killed, someone went into that office, and they didn't leave a paper clip by mm -hmm. So, folks, it's a big battle. It's a tough battle. Really is shameful. But we're going to fight it. In fact, the matter is, on, uh, uh, in reference to that, on the 27th, no, I'm sorry, 26th. on the 26th of March, we're going to go to Independence Hall at Mount Severe Farm. We have the exact replica of Independence Hall in Philadelphia right here in Buena Park. We're going to go there and do a sidewalk prayer summit in Nancy's memory. And we're going to pray up the street to here, and hopefully you can come back and speak. Hopefully you can come. We're going to have speakers. We're going to come here, and we're going to celebrate in infamy the fact that this dear lady paid the ultimate price, as well as her husband. And we're going to continue to fight this fight to That's get right. children back. They can't have our kids. They cannot they have can't. our kids. In fact, the matter is, I have people quite often that are in religion you know, pastors and people in religion saying, Pastor, why are you so big on this? And I said, well, let me just tell you. Hmm. I'm big on it not only because I'm a father and a grandfather and a great-grandfather, but I'm big on it because Jesus was big on it. That's right. Jesus said it would be better that you had a millstone tied about your neck and thrown in the deepest part of the ocean than to if just offend one of these children, let alone abuse them, let alone traffic them, but if you just uh, uh, offend one of them. And the symbolism that he used there was very detailed. You see, the way people committed suicide in those days in the Holy Land, there was no big river, no, no tall building to jump off of, no weapons to put to your head. Uh, the only way they could commit suicide, there were two ways to commit suicide. One, <coughs> stick yourself with a sword, which wasn't too attractive. The other was to find a heavy millstone tied about your neck and jump in the water. And that millstone would take you down and kill you. 
Jesus said it would be better that you did that than to offend a child. That's right. And so, folks, sure. I'm behind this because Jesus would be mm -hmm. and because I serve Jesus, as well as the fact that I'm a grandpa and a great-grandpa, mm -hmm. and I love kids, and I want to help the kids, and I want to help the moms and the dads, and I want them to help get their kids back. But I do it primarily because that's what Jesus would tell us to do and is telling us to do. Wendy, tell us a little bit about your story. What's that? Tell us how many children you have and what the circumstances are briefly. I have three little boys. My oldest son, um, he's 14 and he's autistic and displayed violent behavior from the time he, out, right after he had his MMR shot, he had his first violent meltdown. I've never seen a child act like that in my life. And um, it took until the age of six because he was so high functioning to get a diagnosis of Asperger's. Mm. Um, and so he's my 14 year old and I have a 10 year old and I also have a four year old. And um, they are true victims. Mm. They're being held against their will. They don't want to be there. No, of course where, not. Where are they? Um, my oldest son is, um, I, I gotta be careful because my case is open. Oh, oh, oh. They are in the um, evil clutches of the sadistic system. They're in the system. They're in the system. Um, my oldest son is in a, his third institution, being over medicated. Yeah. And um, my two younger sons um, recently moved to their eighth foster home in. Um, let's see, it was two years, November twenty eighth. Um, so a little over two years, they're in their mm -hmm. eighth foster home. And every time I see them, they have bites on them. They have some sort of scratch on them. The last thing I heard, the last visit we had, I, I get to see them a whole four hours a month. I mean, mm -hmm. their generosity just overwhelms oh, me. Oh uh, yeah. Um, I mean, oh yeah, best interest of the child, WIT codes, yeah, okay. let's not go by them, let's not be bound by them. Yeah. They're, they, they absolutely just turn their back on the law yeah. and then criminalize us as the parents. They, they demonize us, they, they paint this picture of who we're not. I was heroic with my autistic son. I'm an amazing mother and for anyone to tell me any different, that, that, that's, that's not of God. God, God gives us our children to raise. That is our God-given right. The government is not above God. That's right. But they're is, placing themselves above God. And ladies and gentlemen, like I said, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a novice in this thing. I've been doing this for 25 years. I've had hundreds of families through here. And I've seen hundreds of mothers. And uh, in all those years, I've only seen one case where I would even come close to saying the children should be taken away. Right. Only yeah. one case. One out of 17 families. All, all the rest of them, did they make mistakes? Were they perfect parents? No. But they were trying and they were doing their best. I have seen people jump through so many hurdles and so many hoops and take so many parenting classes and take so many. I, I, had, a, I had a situation here recently where there was a lady who had uh, uh, the system said basically if you'll just test clean for a period of time you can have your children back sure over four years she tested 100 percent clean and, and the kids are still in the system right it is it's absolutely easy. they jump nothing in, and and the reason is and there's two men that that i want to hold accountable um uh, one is rick santorum and the other is um Newt Gingrich. They put into law Title 4D and 4E. Those laws give the system thousands of dollars to keep the system going. Here's what happens, the reality. Title 4D and Title 4E give to the system approximately $4,000 per child per month. My autistic one is $6,000. Unless, unless they can be diagnosed as sure. autistic. Mm -hmm. And also, by the way, they don't have to be autistic. No. All the social worker who doesn't even have a bachelor's degree, that social worker can go to work today mm -hmm. and write a letter, just hand write a note, to the caseworker and say, little Joey should be designated as a special use mm -hmm. child mm -hmm. because he's not paying attention. 
Right. Well, praise the Lord, I'd have been diagnosed all my life as a kid. I never <laughs> paid attention. I still don't pay attention sometimes. But the bottom line is they designate that child as a special needs child. You know why? Not because he has special needs. They get two to four thousand more dollars because right. he's a special needs child. And it's not that a psychiatric social worker or a medical profession mm -hmm. has to designate it. Let me give you a perfect example. They're not even parents half the time. Yeah. Let me give you another example of that in the system. I went to court with a family, and the judge had said, <clears throat> I want the psychiatric caseworker, not a psychiatric specialist, but a psychiatric social worker. Right. I want that social worker to evaluate this child and give me a report, and that report will determine whether I take the child away or not. Yeah, total immunity. Now, that psychiatric worker wrote this note on letterhead and said, I find no psychological problems with this child. And signed him. That's it. So we went to court. And the judge reads the paper and said, this note says, I find psychological problems with hmm. this child. He misread it. No, he didn't misread it. What had happened is the case worker whited out the word no. After signing it? After signing it. She whited it out, and now her signed paper says, not I find no psychological problems, to I find psychological problems. And so the judge said, so I'm not going to give the child back. And I stood up and said, the mother was there saying, Pastor, that's been changed. And I said, are you sure? She said, absolutely. And I said, your honor? And he said, you're not allowed to speak. This is family court, confidentiality, all that kind of nonsense. And I said, your honor, I will speak. <clears throat> he said, if you do, I'll arrest you. I said, well, get your job, but I hope you had a big breakfast <laughs> for, your, for your bailiff because I'm going to say what I want to say. I said, if you'll hold that piece of paper up and look at it, you will see that it's been whited out. Now do your job. And his face turned red, and he said, meet me in my chambers. Hmm. We go into chambers, and he said, Pastor Drake, I don't appreciate you doing that. I said, I don't appreciate you doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, but you've got to do what's right. Pride? And so he went back in and said, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to admit this, but this preacher pointed out to me this document has been altered. <laughs> Therefore, I am not going to take the child away. <laughs> Praise God for that. Mm -hmm. Now... What happened with that? Nothing. That psychiatric social worker is still on duty at Orangewood Children's Center in Orange County. She didn't even get a report in her file. Nothing. She should have been fired. Absolutely. She should have been fired. And jailed. And jailed for falsifying documents to the court. But would a judge do that? No. He no. just said, well, what are you worried about, Pastor? The child wasn't taken away. Mm. You ought to be happy. I said, I am happy. But that social worker needs to be fired. Yeah. And exactly. if you weren't there to speak up, and if you weren't willing to challenge the judge, because a lot of people say, well, uh, all right, judge said I have to be yep. quiet. Yep. They scare you into it. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. scare tactics. It's I a piece of oh, power. Yeah. I, wanted Go ahead, to, I wanted to address two things that you said, if I may. Sure. First and foremost, the reason that our families are being destroyed is because the enemy is out to kill, to rob, and to destroy. Yeah, that's, right. that, that's true. If, yeah. you, if your family is not together, it affects everybody down the line, especially your children, exactly. which then in turn, when they get into adulthood, are looking for ways to hide that pain somehow. Yeah. And sure. that pain is hidden by whatever they can find. Alcohol, mm -hmm. drugs, sex. Whatever yeah. there is. Secondly, <clears throat> in my case, uh, there was a doctor that uh, hooked up with my ex mm -hmm. and never having met me, never having seen me, wrote and faxed over a letter to the judge that said, this is the worst sociopath I've ever met in my life. So first of all, that's illegal for him to do that. Secondly, it's illegal for him to give a diagnosis about me without seeing me You're or meeting me. You're a sociopath? Me. Yeah, I was yeah, a sociopath. Sure you are. <laughs> so I found out, <laughs> and I got really upset with him. And one of the things you can do is I wrote to the uh, Psychological Association, 
and I wrote and documented everything and I took that paper and I sent it in and it took two years, two and a half, three years, but they eventually sanctioned him, put a blot on his letter uh, so that if somebody looks him up, and again, you're right, it is all about the money, but if you can have these things that will actually show that there has been some kind of hanky-panky mm -hmm. previously, then if you're going to go look and which people should do today, mm -hmm. it, whenever they go to a psychologist or an attorney or something like that, look them up online, see what kind of uh, marks there are on his record or no marks on their record, because then you can start to go to where you need to go. But clearly, this is predicated upon money now, because yeah. first of all, the courts are going to make money because yeah. you have to file, the respondent has to file, so they make money off of both of you. Yeah. Right. Secondly, the attorneys are making money. It's in their best interest to drag out the case. Absolutely. And, you know, they're charging you and charging you and charging you, so the longer they charge you, the more money they make. That's right. Exactly. And thirdly, you are absolutely right. Now, these entities like... Uh, child Protective Services are making money off of children. And it's got nothing to do with the best interest of the child. I hate it when I hear that because I know that when somebody says that, they're not about anything about the best interest of the child right. within the system. That's I'm not right. saying uh, outside of that. It's a systematic problem. It, sure. Within the system, all they want is the money and they could give a rat's behind about your child. That's exactly true. Right. And they don't care. All they want to know is where that money is at. Right. Fourthly, why can't people who are known to have written these type of things be sanctioned by the courts themselves. Because again, it is all about the money coming into them. Yep. They're all in bed together. They are. Yep, they, they really are. are. Yeah. Even the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is certainly not a bastion of conservatism, mm -hmm. the Ninth, we call it the Ninth Circuit, Ninth Circus. <laughs> they have stated Circus. in their case that went all the way to the Supreme Court, the Hardwick case. Look it up, folks. Don't trust me. Look Hardwick. it up. Hardwick, Hardwick yeah. case. Yeah, there's a case law Look out it of up. that one, right? I'm sorry? There's a case law out of that one, Hardwick. Yes. 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 Yeah, I'm familiar with it. But here's what happened. They, they even said, the Ninth Circuit says, that there seems to be a financial incentive <laughs> to keep mm. the children away from the family. <laughs> That's wow. what the Ninth Circuit said. And it goes on and on and on. And the fact of the matter is, it says a child that has been abused, it's more dangerous for them to be in the system right. than it is to be back in, in the abused public. situation. That's, That's right. what the court said. And yet, they still won't do anything about it. I had a lady call me a few weeks ago. And say, Pastor Drake, I know you're a prayer warrior. And by the way, that's one of the things that we can do positive. That, that's right. And that is right. pray. And I'm going to give that you that prayer right. number in a minute. But that's what we can do. She said, I know you're a prayer warrior. Prayer warrior. And she said, I need your prayer. She said, I am married. I've got two children. But my husband has a very low pay job. And we're eking out a living here in Orange County. And I said, well, I'll pray for you. I promise you I will. She said, but the reason I want you to pray for me is I work for the system. And she said, I think I'm going to be fired. Hmm. And I said, well, for what? She said, well, not really fired, but she said, I think my job is going to be phased out. Therefore, I won't have a job. And I said, well, what makes you think that? She said, well, my supervisor called me in and said, how many do you have on your caseload? And she's a child protective service agent. Mm -hmm. She said, well, I have six. And she said, that's not enough. Wow, that's amazing. In order for us to justify paying you, giving you benefits, and letting you keep your job, you've got to have at least eight clients on your caseload. And she said, how can I do that? I'm trying to put them off my caseload, right. back with their family. Right. And the system is saying, you're going to lose your job. Mm -hmm. Intriguing. Wow. You're going to lose your job because you're not giving more kids on your caseload. 
you're giving them back to the family. Yeah, you're not bringing you're in not enough money. You're not bringing in enough money. Not, and, and on top of that, as you said, if there's an abused child that gets put into the system, there's going to be more abuse mm -hmm. in that system that they're put into. Right. You know, how many times have you heard stories of um, smaller children being put in with children that are physically larger and things like that? And then there's the bullying that goes on within there. You know, all this nonsense about bullying this, bullying that. Have you looked at the system? Yeah. Have you looked oh, at the system? Of what they they're the worst offenders. And then those kids come out of there. You're absolutely right, Pastor. They come out of there in a worse condition than they went in. And it's unfortunate that it is all about the money and it is all about the destruction. We have to, as you say, pray. And, you know, I'm really looking for somebody because I, I understand parental alienation, grandparent mm -hmm. alienation. Oh, I understand that. alienation it. is the worst abuse out there. I, yeah. I understand all that. We have to find somebody that has the gravitas to be able to start going to all of the people on Capitol Hill to start telling them this has to change, look at what's going on, and somebody has to fight that fight, but it is going to be a long, hard fight. Yeah. It is a long, hard either, fight. Because they'll just get murdered. It, it is a long, hard well, fight. And if they want to yeah. murder me, they better come packing, I'll tell you. <laughs> right. yeah. Because we go, I go to Capitol mm -hmm. Hill once a month, and I'm not saying it's to brag, folks. I'm no. saying we're doing something. Glory to God. Once a month, we go to Capitol Hill. If you're out there watching me and listening and you have a story, you would like for me to go to your senator or your representative and talk to them on Capitol Hill, I'll be glad to do so. So, here's what you do. You get in touch with me. You tell me your story, and I will take it to Capitol Hill. We're doing that all the time. And the more we do it, the more successful we will be. Okay. So please contact me. I'm going to give you a couple of phone numbers. 714-865-8132. That's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's another number, 202, on the hill. 202-747-4839. Call me. Give me your case. We dedicated ourselves to the Lord a long time ago on this program. We can't take it to court for you because we're not lawyers. And I don't know enough about the law to take it to court, but I do know enough about the court of public opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think people are getting sick and tired of hearing this kind of story, but happy now that it's a happy ending, mm -hmm. but sick and tired of hearing stories like Wendy's and others yeah. and knowing that the system is literally destroying our families. And it's time we speak up against it. And we are speaking up against it. Please join us. Please come in and give us your story. Uh, but again, I want to say a little bit of a warning. We had a lady come in this studio and tell her story. When we got through at the top of the hour, she walked outside. They put her in handcuffs. Mm. She had violated a gag order. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're big about that. Yeah, they are. They go to the judge and get a gag order and say, you can't talk to anybody, let alone the press. In that particular case, we were able to get her out of jail because the gag order, number one, wasn't signed, and number two, the date was two years old on it. That was the paperwork. I'm not an attorney, but my goodness, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out, no. you better let that woman go, yeah. and they did. But she spent three days in jail. Yeah, the damage was already done. She spent three days in jail. <laughs> Jail's not fun. No. And it's not fun. No. Until we could get something done about it. Anything else either of you would like to add at this point? We only have about eight or nine minutes left. Uh, Linda, you had something? Is there a Nancy Schaefer Foundation yet? What a great idea. I, I can't answer that. I don't know whether there is or not. I, well, well let's I, know start you one. I know you can't answer it, but I just think we should do that. I agree. Absolutely. I agree. That woman's a part of my heart. Yeah. I want She's to a, she was a great woman. She is a great woman. She's in heaven. But uh, yes, she, is. she paid the ultimate price. The very thing we're talking about here, Nancy poured her life into, she paid in two ways. One way she told me she was going to pay. She was running again for state senator. They took away her sentence. And because she was rocking the boat, her opponents got her diselected and got right. themselves elected because they said she was a troublemaker. 
-hmm. And so she didn't get elected. That's the first cost it cost her. Right. And secondly, it literally cost her her life. They brutally shot her to death and yeah. her husband. No way did Bruce, and I knew him, no way did he shoot and kill yeah. his wife. No way. And no way uh, would he have committed suicide even if he had a shot his wife. But he didn't. In fact, the matter is, if you go and research the case, you will find in the FBI report that on his body there were no nitrate deposits mm -hmm. on his body except where the bullet went into his chest. One inch diameter around the bullet hole there was nitrate deposits. Now, what's that mean? That means if I take a small caliber, 22 caliber pistol, and I fire it, even at arm's length, fire it one time, you can put a black light on me for up to 24 hours, and there will be nitrate deposits on my arm, in my hair, and all over my upper torso, mm -hmm. just by firing a small 22 caliber weapon. The weapon that he fired, supposedly, was a forty-five. <laughs> no nitrate deposits except around the bullet hole. No nitrate deposits on Nancy. Had he have shot her at close range, which they said he did, that would have been nitrate deposits all over her, all over the bed, and there were no nitrate deposits. So after he killed himself, he washed his hands and wiped the guns clean, right? Absolutely. Okay. That's no. what they want you to believe. In fact, the matter right. is, the other part of that sure. report is, is that... The, the forensic report on the weapon itself is the weapon was 45 pistol, it was laying by his body, and it had, did it have, and it's places to check, did it have complete prints? Did it have partial prints? Did it have smudges of prints? No, nothing. Not one smudge on the weapon. So they want you to believe, and me to believe, that he took a pistol, shot and killed his wife, shot and killed himself by shooting himself in the, in the chest. chest. Nobody commits suicide that no way. They put it to their head or in their mouth. But they want you to believe that he shot and killed his wife, shot and killed himself, wiped the gun clean, laid on the floor, and waited for the police to get there. Yeah, now, that, that's how, like, like, the OCD way to kill yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's perfect. Anything else y'all would like to share? Uh, if I may, yeah. I, would, sure. I would just like to ask uh, my book, wehaveyourdaughter.com. It's on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Nobles. It's on iTunes. I also have a website, uh, wehaveyourdaughter.com, has information. It actually has a couple of tapes of my daughter and myself uh, talking about the book. My daughter is Wonderful. now 25, Amen. 26. Uh, she's graduated college, working, uh, lives right around the corner from me. We have a very good relationship. I am writing the second book now, mm -hmm. and the second book is called Now That You Have Your Daughter, Pray for Grace, because I had to raise her by myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, And, folks, I want to give you an incentive to get the book. Now, we haven't talked about this. Uh, I told him that I would come on and promote his book, and I'm going to promote his book, and I'm going to give you an incentive to get the book. If you get this book, I'll give you up to 15 minutes on the Wiley Drake Show <laughs> to give us a book report. Uh -huh. oh, I'm going to give a review on Amazon. But, you, but you've yeah. got to have the book in hand. I don't want you to call up and say, I don't like that book, or I do like that book, uh -huh. if you don't have the book. So you get the book, you can call me on that 714-865-8132 and say, I will do a book report. You come right into my studio and do a book report uh, for this book. And I'm looking forward to reading it. I haven't read it yet, mm -hmm. but I'm looking forward. And people say, well, you're getting paid for promoting this book. No, I'm not. But a little lady told me, yes, you are too, Pastor, because you told him you wanted a free book. <laughs> <laughs> so I do get a free book out of the deal, okay? Yeah. Sign the free book out of the That's deal. Right, but other than that, seriously, uh, we want to help promote this. Not just because of the book, no. not just because of Jules, but because we're promoting what is right. Exactly. We're promoting what is right. And uh, we've asked Wendy to serve as the family correspondent. She not only is with WhiteoutPress.com. I am with WhiteoutPress.com. My and so, editor is Mark Walkler. He's okay. a wonderful, like-minded um, fighter. Um, he's had a 20-year battle with, with CPS. If people want to find out more about it, they go to whiteoutpress.com. That's all right there on our show, on our shirt. Check it out. And if you want to hear on the Wiley Drake Show, call me up and say, hey, have her back on again. Call her up and say, hey, get on the Wiley Drake Show. We'd love her here. We do two shows a day, five days a week. 
Jules, you're welcome back anytime. We have an open studio policy. Y'all are welcome to walk in, come in. We have Linda Jones with us on the set today. She is with uh, Litigation Logistics Group Incorporated. Group Incorporated, and that's what they do. They are logicians, litigation. Logistics and litigation. Right, and so they're here to help. And so get in touch with me, get in touch with her, get in touch. Let's work this thing together. Right. Let's correct the problems that have occurred. Yeah. Let's rebuild our family. <laughs> if I, That's, yeah, go ahead. If I may, one more thing. Please don't give up. Please don't, don't give, give up absolutely. on your children. It took eight years for me. And let me tell you, don't take a plea. Yeah, there don't were, do what I did. There are many dark days, yep. many dark days. When you fight, continue to fight. And when you fought, continue to fight. And when you fought that, continue to fight. Amen. Because it's your children right. that you're fighting. And for. I say this in all seriousness, folks. When you're fighting, and in the darkest hour of the night, and you say, I want to give up, give me a call. Let me talk to you. Let me talk you out of it. Mm -hmm. right. Let me talk to you. Let me pray with I you. I don't time. have all the answers, but I am a good listener. Mm -hmm. And you can call me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I keep these phones. This is 714-865-8132. This is in the same area code that Barack Obama's in. <laughs> unfortunately, 202-747-4839. Both of those phones are on 24 hours a day. I never turn them off. This has got a Mophie on it. This has got a battery on it. My phones never die either. This phone, will, I can charge this phone. It's charging all the time, and so call me. I don't have all the answers, but I do have a prayer, Amen. and I can pray, and I do know how to pray. The Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C., .org. That's how you find it. Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C., .org. You don't have to remember all of that. Just call me and I'll be glad to give it to you. Or go to Google and go to Congressional Prayer Conference of Washington, D.C., and you can pull it up. You'll see that we have another gentleman on there with us, and I have to close out with this. His name is Clyde Rivers. Yes. Clyde Rivers is a pastor. He's not only my co-chairman on the Congressional Prayer Conference, but he is the ambassador at large for the African country of Burundi. Hmm. And so pray with him and pray for him. He's my co-chairman. And I want to say to Jules, thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you for being thank on the you. show. Thank you so and much Wendy, for having me, Pastor. God bless you. And uh, I told her I wasn't going to put her on camera, and we're not. But uh, Wendy's mom is here. Elizabeth, right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Elizabeth Plard, my mother. Dr. I Elizabeth. In awe of this woman. And, and we've, got, we've, we've got to talk about some stuff uh, because I just found out about something recently, and I'm going to give a plug for it, and then we're going off. And it's called RX Coffee. RX Smart, Smart Coffee. coffee. Mm -hmm. Go to RX Smart Coffee. It's coffee that has all kind of herbs and things in it that help you. Uh, I was a coffeeholic, still am, but I'm drinking smart coffee now uh, <laughs> rather than dumb coffee, all right? So we're going to talk about that with her later. But uh, God bless you. Remember, folks, the motto for this program, based on Micah 6, 8, Matthew 23, 23, do justice, love mercy, and walk with God. That's our goal, and that's what we're going to do. That's Good right. day, and God bless.